Hi, everyone. We're joined today by David J. Halperin. Let me just introduce him briefly. He um, was a UFO investigator back in his teen years. Um, later, he became a professor of religious studies. His specialty is religious traditions of heavenly ascent. From 1976 through 2000, David taught Jewish history in the religious studies department at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Now retired from teaching, he lives in North Carolina and is the author of nonfiction books on Jewish mysticism and messianism, including Faces of the Chariot, Development of Rabbinic Exegesis of Ezekiel's Vision of the Divine Chariot, Abraham Miguel Cardozo, Selected Writings, uh, co-authored with Elliot R. Wolfson, Seeking Ezekiel, Text and Psychology, Sabbatai Zevi, Testimonies to a Fallen Messiah, and a contributing chapter to Mortimer Osto's Ultimate Intimacy, The Psychodynamics of Jewish Mysticism. He's also the author of a coming-of-age novel, Journal of a UFO Investigator, and also Intimate Alien, The Hidden Story of the UFO. And he's also currently translating a work of Jewish mysticism, and it'll be titled, I Came This Day to the Spring. Maybe actually we can start on that a little bit. So what exactly is Kabbalah mysticism and how does it differ from, let's say, mainstream Judaism? And um, why did you become fascinated by it and make it a focus of your academic studies? Oh my, that is a, that is a big question. Let's say that Kabbalah is an attempt to draw together the structure of the universe, the human experience, spe then specifically the Jewish experience, which involves the fulfillment of the patterns of life prescribed by traditional Judaism, and most of all, the words of scripture, and using scripture as an index to draw all of these dimensions together. To the Kabbalists, what they were doing was not a deviation from traditional Judaism, but the understanding of the depths of traditional Judaism. We say certain prayers, certain formulae. Uh, we perform certain ritual acts like the drinking, the blessing and the drinking of a cup of wine at the entry of the Sabbath. All of these are explained in Kabbalah as reflections of and attempts to influence the inner processes of God, who is the really the unifying force drawing them all together. As such, Kabbalah functioned for centuries as the esoteric theology of Judaism. And it was only in the 18th century that it became discredited because it was totally alien to anything that the burgeoning sciences of the 17th and 18th century could accept. How did I become fascinated with it? Because I'm interested in what goes on beneath the surface 
of reality and ways in which people in the past have construed what goes on beneath the surface of reality. This is what drew me to UFOs. It what, it's what drew me to Freud and then to Jung. And would you say that your background in religious studies was a major part in kind of helping you circle back onto your prior interest in UFOs? I don't think I ever really left it. Mm -hmm. Because as you mentioned, when I became, when I, when I formally, nominally left my UFOs behind me, retired from the field, as it were, to go to college. I was still attracted. The, 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 the old, the flame did not die out. And the more deeply I pursued Judaic studies, the more I found myself drawn to things which even at the time I recognized as my old ufology in disguise. I do not know exactly when I stopped believing in UFOs. Probably sometime during my college years. If the belief faded very, 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 very gradually and imperceptibly, but by the time I was entering graduate school and I was found myself dealing with a form of mysticism that was older than Kabbalah, there's the Merkava mysticism, the mysticism focused on the vision of the first chapter of Ezekiel. I knew that what I was dealing with was UFOs. And when I studied otherworldly journeys and heavenly ascensions, I knew also that something of the same impulses that drove me to UFOs were operating. And is that the thing that pulled you to Jung as well? And what did you what did you find about his ideas which were particularly compelling, which perhaps other explanations didn't, uh, couldn't live up to? Well, I'll tell you, I started, re at the first time I read his classic book on flying saucers was when I was 12 years old. That mm -hmm. was when a, a friend of mine and I worked, uh, we were going to do a, uh, an extra credit paper for a science class. And we found ourselves getting interested in, in UFOs. We, we both read Gray Barkers. They knew too much about flying saucers, which was one of the three books on flying saucers, as we used to call them back then, uh, in the library, public library at Levittown, Pennsylvania. And one of the other two books was Jung's Flying Saucers. And at age 12, I read it. I could not make head or tail out of it. Then in 1970, quite by accident, and I'll, I can go into a little more detail what that accident was, at Stanford, I met a man who whom we both know well, whose work we both know well, and that was Jacques Vallée. Mm -hmm. And that was the year after he'd published his Passport to Magonia. And I read Passport to Magonia, and I said, this, th 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 this guy is on target. He's helping to explain what the UFOs are, what they mean to us, how they fit in to our religious awareness of the cosmos. And 
that sent me back to Jung. And by that time, I'd gotten a certain degree of psychological sophistication. And when I read Jung again, I could see that he was presenting a model for understanding UFOs and UFO lore that the, the literal belief in space visitors that I had once championed could not account for. That, mm -hmm. the, that UFOs as something coming from within us made sense in a way that UFOs coming from outer space did not. And I conceived then the conviction, which has accompanied me ever since, that that did not make them one bit less important. Yes. You've mentioned that um, you're a Jungian in some moods and a Freudian in others. What do you mean yeah. by that? Well, I think I would, I, 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 I represent what I see as the Jungian attitude toward Freud, which is that he was absolutely right. You know, that he may have made some mistakes, but overall, his understanding of the unconscious was true and valid, and that his only major error was to think that he discovered the whole truth when in fact he discovered only a portion of it. So yeah, there are, there are elements of ufology, of UFO experience that the idea of some sort of repressed sexuality being projected into the skies can well account for. But there are other aspects that seem to go deeper. And there I've found Jung to be the best guide. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about these ideas or archetypes erupting from the unconscious, um, uh, what, under what conditions do you think that that is most likely to happen yeah, on an individual basis? It's a very good question that I don't think I can answer. I mean, one of my favorite UFO experiences is that of John Lennon and May Pang mm -hmm. in August of 1974, in which they encounter a UFO that is passing perhaps a hundred yards away or even closer from their, the balcony of their penthouse apartment in Manhattan. And it's a dome disc. And Lennon says that if I had a, uh, a, 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 a stone, I could have thrown it and hit it. Now, as it happened, according to their account, May Pang did have a camera. She took a whole series of photos of it, uh, all of which came out blank, from which I infer, first of all, that uh, there was nothing physically there, but also that J Lennon and Pang were not making up the story. If they'd been making up a story, they would not have included a detail that undermines it. Now, the thing that struck me in reading and watching videos of their testimony is that they stress again and again that they both were naked, that Lennon used to like to hang around the, uh, the apartment naked, Pang had just finished showering. And I, I asked the question, why was the nakedness 
of the witnesses important to the story. If you assume that they just happen to be there, when an extraterrestrial vehicle passed by, then how, what, what clothes they were or were not wearing are of no importance. But now assume that they are as much a part of the encounter as the disc is. And I go on to ask, where else do we read or hear about a naked human couple confronted by a numinous presence? And I think back to the third chapter of Genesis, where the naked Adam and Eve confront a deity who appears there in human form rather than in the form of a circular disc, which Jung would call, I think appropriately, a mandala. Now, what I'm seeing here is the eruption of, I'll call it an archetypal scene from the unconscious in the experience of two very secular modern people, possibly aided by chemical means. But once we've said that, I don't think we've explained anything. Yes. So we circled now back to your question. What was there that made the this object appear at precisely that time to precisely those people? And I do not know the answer. I can partly move toward it by looking at Lennon's song, Imagine, from three years earlier, which was his most famous song of the post beatle period, in which he says, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try, there's no hell beneath our feet, above us only sky, which Max Weber would have called the disenchanted heaven. And it seems to me that there the enchanted heaven is reasserting itself. And this would fit a Jungian model that something, some awareness of the numinous, or as I would say, numinous potential within ourselves that we normally keep hidden is forcing itself upon our attention. Yes. And so can you think of any ways of testing the Jungian idea in ufology? Like what sorts of predictions would you derive from it or what sort of data would you try to gather? <sighs> I think I would try to see if Jungian patterns appear across the board. I know I dealt with cases where the Jungian quaternity seems to be present. And of course, the disc itself would suit the mandala. Mm -hmm. But scientifically, we ought to be able to say that if the hypothesis works, it should apply at least to a fair chunk of the data. And so far, I've been working with really extrapolating from a certain set of experiences to this hypothesis it do, it does demand testing mm -hmm. is the jungian idea still somewhat out of favor in psychology or is it do you think making a comeback of sorts my sense is that in academic psychology it is still it is still, I was going to say discredited, but that implies that it's been rejected. It's still 
outside the realm of what's normally what's normally put on the table not quite as acutely as freud is i mean freud these days is about as uh, fashionable as mutton chop whiskers and i think people are more inclined to be open toward jung but there's no question that we're dealing with theories which from the viewpoint of academic psychology are too highly speculative to be useful. If, if Jungian psychology is, turns out to be valid, um, what is its ultimate basis? Like, do you think it's an evolutionary psychology or is it uh, like hardwired reflexes shaped by evolutionary forces like natural selection? Or do you think that um, it's something culturally purely cultural, which is passed on as a collective memory. No, I think it's something that is, uh, that, 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 that is biological, that's within us, but refracted through cultures. Mm -hmm. And part of what ufology needs to do, and I'm speaking of ufology as an accredited science here, what ufology needs to do is to separate out that which is universal in UFO belief and experience from that which is local, culturally dictated, or dictated by the experience of the individual. I think all of these elements are present. Yes. You've spoken a lot about the role of death in yeah. the visions that people have and refracted, as I, I guess Jung might say, um, into UFOs or aliens. Um, but do you think that death is an integral part of the UFO mythos, or can you also have a religious experience uh, via the UFOs without death being a theme? Yes, the, uh, I think the answer to both parts of the question is yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are, there are experiences like that. Well, I was going to say like that of John Lennon, but it's possible that death might be late there. Since after all, when God appears to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the message he brings them is, dust thou art and to dust shalt thou return. But certainly there are UFO experiences where death does not seem to be explicitly present. It does strike me that the most familiar of all the, the UFO mythology, of all the, uh, the mythic themes, that appear in the UFO mythology. The one that is best known is Roswell. And it seems to me that death is at the heart of Roswell. Mm -hmm. That, and, and I mean, there is, uh, those, those who, are, who see UFOs as a religious phenomenon, which is which I do, but many use that as kind of a belittling category yeah. to say, well, you know, uh, people are, nowadays we can't really believe in God. The traditional religions have crumbled, uh, but people are still too weak to stand alone. So we imagine saviors from outer space coming to redeem us. But then that, that, understanding stumbles up against the reality of Roswell where the UFO pilots can't even save themselves, much less us. And they are children. 
they're frail, their heads are outsized in comparison with their body. So they are helpless children falling to a death that they cannot avert. In other words, very much like you and me. Well, getting back to Jacques Vallée, um, you, you mentioned a passport to Magonia. What do you think that Vallée has gotten right and what do you think he's gotten wrong? Because I, I would guess that you don't credit his interdimensional hypothesis, for example. No, I don't at all. I, but I think, what he, I think what he's got right is that there is a, co a, 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 a continu continuum. Is that how you pronounce it, or continuum? I've never, continuum, yes. I think, yep. Yeah, a continuum of UFOs with fairy legends, mythology, traditions about the little folk, the wee folk, that these, the parallels are so strong that these seem to belong together, and that that demands some explanation. Now, Robert Schaefer, who you, uh, you, 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 I think you've referred to him at times, who was a very prominent skeptic, has mm -hmm. expressed astonishment that Valet should have noticed this and does not draw the obvious conclusion that, uh, that, that, that UFOs don't exist any more than Tinkerbell does. Right. But that is not quite so obvious because when you're dealing with fairy lore, we're dealing with traditions that have been handed down for, for decades, if not centuries, uh, set third, fourth, fifth hand reports, uh, so that it's easy to say, oh, yeah, the, the, the supposed experiencers never existed in the first place. And if they did exist, they didn't uh, experience anything like what they described. But with, but with UFOs, you are dealing with people who speak of their own experiences. And, and here, the, this, this becomes a very tricky, very tricky and very painful issue that there's usually no good reason to say that they're faking it, except that what they're describing can't be true. Mm -hmm. And that uh, this is very painful because, I mean, like, I, I, I've written about this on my blog, uh, that, okay, Whitley Strieber, we'll, we'll take him as an example, experiences things that, I cer are, 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 are certainly not, I, I've certainly never experienced anything like that. Uh, I don't know if you have you're, you're, yourself. Uh, so what, what am I to do with that? I, 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 I can say, okay, he's lying or he's nuts. But do I really know that my experience is the yardstick of all human experience. Now, Jeff Kripal, who's written some really brilliant stuff on UFOs and related phenomena, who was the spirit behind this uh, Ar Archives of the Impossible conference last March at Rice University, Kripal is particularly uh, inclined to accept Strieber's accounts because Kripal had an experience of his own when he was in uh, Kolkata, I think, at a Kali festival, he felt himself plugged in to some source of overwhelming erotic energy, female in nature, like the goddess Kali, which is plainly sexual, but not in the sense of a transient itch below the navel, but some sort of a divine force into whose hands it is a dreadful thing to fall, as the epistle to the Hebrews puts it. 
Okay, so Kripalus uh, had this experience. So when Strieber has parallel experiences with an overwhelmingly female, feminine entity who behaves toward him quite abusively, he can say, yes, this, uh, uh, the, 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 this, this rings true. Now, here comes David Halperin, who's never had any such experience. What is David Halperin supposed to say? If I can say Whitley Strieber is crazy or lying, which I don't, by the way, I have a lot of respect for Strieber, then am I really going to say that of Kripal, a scholar whose work uh, is first rate by all the canons of scholar, the conventional canons of scholarship that I grew up with, and which every time I read him, I get new insights. Am I to say that about him? At the same time, I can't, I'm, I am as outside it as a lifelong virgin is to understanding what sex or so sexual intercourse feels like. Well, what, what is the probative power of my virginity? Probably not much. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know how to respond to the question of are we to accept these testimonies at face value? And Valet gave the answer, and this is where we come back to where we started from. Valet gave the answer, yes, we've got to. Therefore, there is this uh, other dimension, this realm that shares the earth with, with our familiar realm of experience, which Valet called Magonia, and that name has stuck because the, the concept is so powerful. Uh, I can't believe that. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm not going to dismiss the testimony. Yes. Well, speaking of testimony, um, one critique which has been made about you is by brian santis who runs the skunk works blog yeah um, he says that perhaps you don't pay sufficient attention to the female experience how would you do you think that might be a blind spot in your analysis or do you want to respond to that i'm going to give a halfway i'm going to say it is i, I think it's legitimate as a question and an observation. I find it unfair as a criticism. What mm -hmm. do I mean by that? That, and, and uh, I, 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 I've listened to your interview with Brian, mm -hmm. who, is, uh, who, who is just an, uh, has just an extraordinary mind. And I mean, he's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, he, he, he and I, however we much may, we, we may differ over certain issues. I see us as uh, co-workers in the same field. But Br Brian refers to a case that I gave in my book, Intimate Alien, The Hidden Story of the UFO, in which four witnesses see a UFO f up close, which almost certainly has to have been triggered by an airplane, yet distorted beyond recognition, three of them, uh, a, a middle-aged couple and their daughter, experience it as a, a dome disc. The fourth, who is the daughter's 
at first it seems her husband, but then it turns out he's her live-in boyfriend, mm -hmm. sees something that looks like a detumescing penis encased in a condom that has ruptured precisely where it most needs to stay intact. And in fact, the young woman is pregnant. And to me, if, and, and we have to think ourselves back into the 1970s where unmarried couples are regularly having sex, but it is a no-no for them to have children without their being married. Uh, that the, the, to me, it's unquestionable that this young man's conflict over the situation in which he found himself was projected into the sky. Now, Brian says, well, why don't we exa examine how the young woman felt about that? And I think that is an excellent question. How did the young woman feel about it? Unhappily, we do not have the data to answer that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's what I mean that I think what he raised is quite legitimate and important and enlightening as a question, but I don't think I can be faulted for not having discussed it because the data was not available. Yes. And what about the Betty and Bonnie Hill case? I think he 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 uh, might have raised a similar uh, yeah, yeah, point yeah. about that, but um, I think that in that case we've got more data, don't we? About uh, yeah, studies? yeah, yeah, and I think I did. I think I did deal with it. Uh, that I don't think, but I, I I I did not, and I will uh, I will I will agree. There is an imbalance here that I stressed. Uh, Barney's memory of having a, uh, a, su a suction cup placed over his groin, which uh, I see as a, how would I say, the, uh, as reflecting the anxiety of a black man mm -hmm. who's married to a white woman and we all know what in the uh, post-Civil War house South happened to black men who showed the slightest inclination yes. to be interested in, in a white woman. I did not, I don't think, lay equal stress on Betty's harrowing experience of a needle thrust through her navel to kill, as I would see it, to kill the fetus that the black man has implanted within her. So yeah, I think I could have put a bit more emphasis on that. At the same time, it is true by all accounts that Betty did not have the tremendously powerful affective response to the memories that arose of the experience that Barney did. Now, there is something I did not know when I wrote Intimate Alien. I conjectured in Intimate Alien that Betty's family had included slaveholders so that she and Barney were bound together in the vast historic crime of slavery and that both shared in the re-experiencing of it, Barney more acutely than Betty. What I did not know, and this was, I owe this to Marty Kottmeyer, that in 1998, in an interview, Betty, specifically said that her ancestors included slaveholders 
And at one point she said, that was why I married Barney, because I couldn't buy him. Now make of that what you will. But to me, it is clear that for both of them, the crime of slavery was a driving force in their unconscious. Yes. Which is, of, go ahead. which is, of course, in no way to the discredit of either of them. In fact, one has to, if I were wearing a hat right now, I would, rem I would take it off to both Barney and Betty that in, at a time when civil rights itself was not respectable in many quarters, they, their love transcended the racial divide. The, these were two heroic people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, but heroism sometimes has its price. And yes. they paid it with these ter with these terrifying pseudo well pseudo memories, but but real memories, just displaced memories. Mm -hmm. I've also heard it said that perhaps Betty's experience was reminiscent of an angel piercing the belly of a. You might know more about this. I forget who exactly it was, but it was a, a lady who, um, in Christian lore was, um, she, I think she was pierced with a lance through her belly and she felt an ecstatic, erotic, almost pain. Do you know yeah, that? Yeah. I think St. Teresa of Avila. Yes, that's the one. And yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I think my, my, my sense is that uh, St. Teresa's piercing was a bit lower in the body than Betty's. But, but yeah, I mean, the comparison is interesting. And this is part of the, the problem you face when you're, when you're trying to draw the connections. I mean, it's really like, did you ever play those follow the dots games? Yeah, when yeah. When you were a kid that, uh, you know, you connect the dots and a picture emerges. Well, here mm. we've got, a, uh, a multitude of dots, but we don't have the numbers that tell us yeah. what connections to draw. So how do we make these connections? I myself had never thought of connecting until about, uh, when was it, 30 seconds ago that you said it? Uh, <laughs> Be Betty's knitting needle with uh, the, the lance that pierced St. Teresa. But... Uh, can I really say there is no, there is, can I really say that there is no connection? I, I don't think I can. And if there is a connection, what is it? Is it possibly that the idea of, the, the image of piercing might be a universal image for the female sexual experience? And that, that, uh, and that there's where the commonality lies? Or is there something more? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Now, this question might throw you, but it's to do with Jung. And you might know that he wrote an essay about Adolf Hitler. And uh, I think it was called Wotan. I think he wrote it in 1936. And um, he was conveying the idea that Adolf Hitler, who he had met personally, uh, I think on a, maybe a couple of occasions, um, Hitler struck him as being not a man, but a vessel for a collective German unconscious, and that he was um, projecting the image of Wotan, uh, you know, during a time when Germany was awash with pseudoscience and fake news, as we would call it today. Do you think that there's a danger in something like that happening again? Like, first of all, do you credit his idea about Hitler, do you think that's possible? And do you think that if it is, then there's a danger that it's going to happen again with some, some other character? 
Oh, okay. Indeed okay. I, mm-hmm. okay. I, I've not read the Wotan essay and I'm not, I'd want to know exactly what it said. I, I had not had the impression he was writing about Hitler personally. I may be wrong there. Uh, I do know that Jung's pronouncements during the rise of national socialism were nothing that anyone could be proud of. That he seems to have regarded it as in as in some beneficial way a reassertion of a German collective unconscious collective identity that had been repressed and in view of the utter enormity of what national socialism turned out to be there is something monstrous about that as jung himself recognized yes. after he after the full ugliness came out uh he, he the, the that sometime after the war he invited i think he was having conferences the eranos conferences for his psychology, and he invited the great scholar of Jewish mysticism, Gershom Sholem, to come from, from Israel. And uh, Sholem was at first very reluctant, but Sholem asked for the advice of Leo Beck, a German rabbi who had been in the concentration camp at Theresienstadt. And Beck went to meet Jung, sat with him for several hours, and was convinced and wrote to Sholem that Jung genuinely regretted mm. his awful blunder. And Sholem was persuaded and, and accepted Jung's invitation. Uh, there, 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 it, 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 it's a story that I wish could have been more heroic. Now, is, is it possible that someone would say, I don't know, that Donald Trump represents some vital for, well, I guess there are many, I, I, and, I, and I'm sorry, I'm being very, uh, you, 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 you feel my political biases here, that, uh, that I do not care much for Donald Trump, and I, I think he is a, very, very dangerous character. Uh, and many people do seem to regard him as almost as almost a messianic figure. So in that sense, yes, it, uh, it has happened. Not only could happen, but has happened again. Mm-hmm. Whether leading intellectuals like Jung would be seduced by by Trump. I do not know. And I do not know further how coherent the philosophy is that Trump represents. My own sense is that his only interest is himself. But he does evoke a kind of, I hate to use the word, but Volkish type of vibe in the American polity, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't know that um, Jung was a kind of, he, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a Nazi himself, was he? Oh, no, not at all. No. Not at all. Now, I think there's no question he had some anti-Semitic uh, inclinations. Right. Uh, which may have been connected with resentment as being so used by the, pro- the overwhelmingly uh, Jewish circles around Freud when, oh, to, to, w- w- when he was part of the Freudian circle. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, was, he was in many respects a very, a very flawed man. I don't think I would have liked him if I'd met him, mm. but I do, I am often 
inspired by what he writes and my whole approach to ufos is uh is i won't say dominated by by by, by, uh, by jung's approach but i keep reverting to it to make sense of what otherwise does not seem to be meaningful yes now the unconscious is so important in the Jungian analysis, are you aware, aware of like many cases where <clears throat> uh, the unconscious admits itself to the subject? So uh, I'm trying to recall this beautiful case that I read about many years ago in a book about UFOs or something. Um, this person had had multiple contact ex um, experiences. And then one day this being admitted that it was the woman's unconscious. Oh, and, now that. <laughs> I, I wish okay. I could remember. That exactly. is beautiful. Yeah. That is beautiful. I always found that so incredibly haunting and um, much more interesting than if it was actually a, you know, an alien. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. But are you, do you know what case that was? And No, I don't. If you find it, please send it to me. But are you aware of any other similar cases where the unconscious kind of explicitly says, this is, this is me, as it were? I'm drawing a blank. Probably, probably 10 minutes after we hang up, I am going to have a <laughs> Eureka experience. Uh, oh, no, the, 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 the the the, par the the examples I think of are too distant, but but I'll state them anyway. Perhaps as we, you know, mm -hmm. we, we can start moving. Well, one is Whitley Strieber, who is quite aware that there is something. I mean, in communion, yeah. there's something. What he's experiencing is something within him. He doesn't say it's it is me. He doesn't say it is my unconscious. But it's something akin to that. Yes. But, the, but they don't. They they don't really announce themselves. The 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 beings he the visitors he calls them. They don't really announce themselves as being his unconscious. Uh, what else? There was something else that I thought of, and now. Oh, uh, the, yeah, yeah. Now I now I know what I was going to say, and that is the recurrent theme of the UFOs mirroring mm. the witnesses. You have it in the famous case of William Booth Gill in yes. 1959, in the broken condom UFO from Philadelphia in 1974. The UFO responds to the auto headlights, and it appears in the Nimitz incident mm -hmm. of 2004, which is one of the things that persuades me that David Fravor wasn't making that up, that the Tic Tac mirrors the movements of Fravor's plane. Uh, I am told, one of the people commenting on my blog wrote, I don't know the source of this, that that happened also in the famous incident in Ari, at the Ariel School. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. the, 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 uh, the so-called aliens mirrored the, action, the, the, the uh, actions of the children. And that would seem to be fairly close to an admission that we are you. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I would just love this case that you, you yeah, refer yeah. to. Yeah, I wish I could track it down again. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it reminds me very much of a, of, of a, of a dream I had many, uh, I don't know, about uh, 10, 20 years ago in which I was doing some things that I really ought not to have been doing and was feeling, you know, the, 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 there's going to be hell to pay. 
and then I I, I was on the U, the the University of North Carolina campus, and I went out of the building in the dream, and I saw that nothing looked the way it was supposed to, and I said in the dream, "Oh, this is a dream, so I can just enjoy it. There will be no consequences." Do you think that the model, um, the Jungian model, can be applied to cases where? The claimant is clearly a fraud. We know that they know that they're a fraud as well. So there's no question about whether they're faking the story. Um, but that nevertheless, they might be expressing certain themes um, that they might not necessarily be cognizant of, like why they're choosing one theme over another. Do well, yeah. Mm -hmm. If we're going to uh, apply the Jungian model or a Freudian model or any a psychological model to a novel or to a painting or to a movie or to what is yeah uh, uh, explicitly a human creation. I don't see why we shouldn't, uh, as a matter of principle, apply it to a lie. Yes. Well, you mentioned in your in Intimate Alien that there are cases where the um, contactee it reports a sense of ascending but also descending at the same time yeah yeah the really i don't think so much the uh, the contactee strictly speaking as the abductee abductee yes yes um do you think that that sort of uh, brings up maybe an anal analogy about this whole field which is about are we searching for higher understanding or deeper understanding yeah, which which image do we use? I mean, I take you know, you know I, t I talked in, in Intimate Alien about the old old problem of why the Merkava mystics called their journey to Ezekiel's chariot the the object of his uh, vision why they called it the descent to the Merkava. And I supposed that they were that this was a an image for the descent into the unconscious. But of course, descent to the unconscious is itself a metaphor. We, when we go down, or I'm on the the uh, the, the analyst's couch, and I, uh, uh, I, I I I go down into the layers of the unconscious. I'm not going down anywhere. I'm still lying on the couch, but that seems to be the image that I use. So I, and I think that is the more powerful image as opposed to the image of ascending to higher knowledge. Mm -hmm perhaps the one that would more spontaneously occur to the person experiencing it. Yes. Can you tell us more about your current translation project? Yes. It's something I began years ago. I let it sit for a few years while working on Intimate Alien and then for another couple of years while working on a novel about uh, Israel during the Yom Kippur War, which we haven't talked about yet. Uh, but this is a translation of a book that created something of a sensation in the Central European Jewish world in 1725. It had been discovered in the luggage of a traveler coming from Prague. And the local rabbinic authorities, they were suspecting that Prague might be a center of heresy, that this was, this, the, 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 this was uh, several decades after uh, the, the messianic movement of Shabbatai Tzvi, who converted to Islam and spawned all sorts of rather strange modes of Judaism. 
Uh, anyway, they found this, they, they, they were searching the luggage of this traveler and they found this book called I Came This Day to the Spring, written in Hebrew. And it's almost certainly written by the rising star of the Rabbinic Academy of Prague, Jonathan Eibeschitz, who was later to become the most prominent rabbi of, uh, of Central Europe. And this is an extraordinary book. It is almost unintelligible. I am not sure whether I am going to be able to translate it in such a way that people can understand it. But at bottom, it is a charter for the world religion of the future, which is rooted in Kabbalistic Judaism, but unlike any religion ever known, that it is a religion of the universal brotherhood and sisterhood of humanity, equ gender equality, and what we would now call marriage equality. And if it were written to say those things in so many words, it would be an incredible document. It is an incredible document, but it's written in Kabbalistic code that has to be deciphered. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what I'm working on now. Wow. Speaking of religion, and maybe this will be my final question. Um, do you think that the UFO religion as such, um, or if you can call it a UFO religion, but the sort of um, religious mythology that's uh, taken off since maybe the 1960s has been on the whole positive, or do you see um, extremist tendencies within it? I guess there are extremist tendencies, but I see it as on the whole benign. I mean, uh, the, the, that uh, do, you, do you remember that whole thing with uh, Storm Area Fifty One back in twenty nineteen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That uh, you know they, that uh, somebody posted that called a Storm Area Fifty One on Facebook, and uh, uh, people. The, 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 something like two million people signed up to do it. And I mean, the, the, the people in Rachel, Nevada were terrified that these millions would descend on them. Turned out it was about 3,000 people. They didn't storm anything. Uh, and they spent their time, I think, mostly dancing and socializing. But you had a, 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 a mixing of people of all political stripes uh, me Tooers and MAGA Hatters and uh, whites and blacks. And they were all united by this, uh, call it this transcendent vision mm -hmm. of something that had penetrated our world, had fallen there. And I I, I think it was, the, the, this would have become a, uh, regular yearly event if uh, the pandemic hadn't intervened and i think uh i i think we've we've lost something by that so i i i i've and and by the way i, I don't know if you've uh, seen the uh the 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 hearing on uf the public hearing on ufos which you know i mean there were there were no particularly exciting revelations but at the end, the, uh, the chairman of the session, uh, Representative Andre Carson, who was a Democrat from Indiana, remarked on how we have here, we have, we've had in this session, a rare display of bipartisanship around UAPs or UFOs. So I think that that, that that the UFO has the potential to unify and bring us into, uh, br bring people into harmony. Now, whether you have to believe in them or not, 
I don't know. And I don't even know what believing in UFOs means. I wrote about this in Intimate Alien, that when I was a teenager, I believed that UFOs were real. I believed they were, they were hostile. It followed we were about to be invaded. So you would think that when the Harvard astrophysicist Donald Menzel published a book that proved that UFOs didn't exist or tried to prove they didn't exist, you'd think uh, young Dave Halperin would have been re relieved and overjoyed. <laughs> In fact, I was scared to death to read that book because my belief was not a literal belief, but a way of dealing with something else, namely my mother's impending death. And that is, of course, why I so look toward death as the central theme, because that's what I know from my experience. Uh, so how many of those people who showed up in Rachel, Nevada, really, really believe that there were aliens being kept in the refrigerators or whatever of Area 51, the same way they believe that, I don't know, when uh, that if they got a reservation on a plane flying from North Carolina to Nevada, that would get them to Nevada. And I, and I don't know the answer. I think it's a, and I think it's a very important question. Mm -hmm. But the but the the overall answer to your question is, I see the UFO as being benign. I know there are many who disagree, but I think, with all due respect, I think they tend to place more weight on the front on what are within ufology as fringe elements mm -hmm. as opposed to what UFO belief does for most of those who hold it. Yes. Uh, Luis, you said that would be the last question. And I would want I would want to make, if I may, that I would want to conclude with an observation yep. that came to me while I was listening to your interview with Brian Sentis. And that is that he asks many questions I didn't ask and explores many things I didn't explore. I mean, one area that I have left almost totally unexplored in Intimate Alien and in my blog as well is the government's involvement with UFOs, that I've tended to take it as face value, that the government has regarded UFOs as a nuisance, and it's sort of done, put up kind of uh, flimsy excuses for investigative uh, investigations just to, just to debunk and dismiss, or else now, I think, to get salaries for people to, uh, you know, to, 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 to try to identify what Navy pilots are seeing without taking it too seriously. That's been my approach. I begin to think that may be too limited and that the government has an engagement and involvement with this that at least I do not understand. And I think I could say we do not understand. And that is an important part of the story. Overall, you remember that old story about the six blind men in India and the elephant? Mm -hmm. I think those of us who like me, like Brian Santis, like I think, if I don't misconstrue you yourself, those of us who think UFOs don't exist, but at the same time are an important phenomenon not to be dismissed, I think we are all in the position of those blind men.
feeling our way around this elephant that sits in the middle of our culture and we do not know what to make of it yes i think that's that's absolutely correct maybe the the government probably doesn't even in some sense it doesn't know why it's interested if it is because there could be layers of i mean people in government are also people and uh, they could have their own personal drives but those are gonna intersect with institutional reasons as well and um so it's it, i mean i don't believe in literal alien visitors or anything like that but i think that there's something which is a bit more interesting than just um what some of the skeptics um you know something a bit more nuanced and mysterious going on that some of the skeptics might uh credit oh that that i certainly believe but i would not and i did not seriously consider that government agencies might be part of that story and now i think they may very well be just i mean i certainly don't believe that they know that they have proof that we're being visited by aliens and that disclosure is imminent. Mm -hmm. But that there's more to the government engagements with UFOs than we understand. And that this is something vital to this overall mystery, to the shape of the elephant. That I am now more prepared to credit. Yes. So, David, um, thank you so much for talking to me. Well, thank you so much for having me as, far as your guest. And I hope we can perhaps continue this conversation at some point in the future. I would enjoy that very much.